The book of Proverbs was written as poetry, and it employs many of the techniques common to Hebraic poetry. Vivid imagery, parallelism, and other literary techniques to guide the reader in the quest for wisdom. The introductory verses of the book express this central theme quote, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. End quote. The wisdom contained within the book of Proverbs covers nearly every aspect of life. The Proverbs focus as much on the quirks of human nature as they do on the basic behavior of a righteous person and on a man's proper relationship to God. Because the Proverbs address such varied topics, a verse in Proverbs often has no connection to the verse before or after it. However, readers can find within Proverbs many passages that are simple, humorous, profound, and beautiful. One well-known passage tenderly describes the attributes of a righteous woman and declares that she is far more precious than rubies. The book of Ecclesiastes is unique because, although the preacher is a believer, he often poses questions and makes statements as if he were not. Everything that he says, therefore, must be taken in context of his final conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 that all of our works in this life will one day be judged by God. The teachings of this book seem to be directed at individuals who do not believe in God, or at least are not yet fully committed to Him. The preacher presents questions and statements that many of these individuals may feel inclined to agree with, but then he helps them to see how much purpose and meaning can come into our lives when we will seek to live in accordance with God's will. At age 65, Enoch was called on a special mission to preach the gospel. That lasted for the next 365 years. The record says of him, And he saw the Lord, and he walked with him, and was before his face continually. And Enoch walked with God 365 years, making him 430 years old when he was translated. Certainly Enoch was one of the best educated men who ever lived in the world. Enoch said, Keep the commandments, and those who did were translated and taken up to heaven. Noah said, Keep the commandments, and those who did not were drowned, and their spirits were sent to the eternal prison house. The prophet Jonah said to the people of Nineveh, Keep the commandments, and when they obeyed, their city was saved. In concluding his book of Ecclesiastes, the wise man Solomon said, Let us then hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. When one came to Jesus and said, What good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Thou knowest the law, keep the commandments. Then on the night preceding his crucifixion, he said to the apostles, If ye love me, keep my commandments. When the people chose apostasy rather than obedience, the dark ages came upon the world. John the Revelator avoided the kind of violent death meted out to the other apostles of Jesus by his banishment to the lonely little isle of Patmos, located in the Aegean Sea. Then with prophetic vision he looked down to our day and said, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made the heavens and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The Church of Jesus Christ, founded upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, has again been restored. And in the year 1972, a great modern prophet, standing shoulder to shoulder with those of other times, is again saying to all of the world and to each of us individually, Keep the commandments, and may God help us to hear and to obey. Different from but related to the fears we often experience 
is what the scriptures describe as godly fear or the fear of the Lord. Unlike worldly fear that creates alarm and anxiety, godly fear is a source of peace, assurance, and confidence. But how can anything associated with fear be edifying or spiritually helpful? The righteous fear I am attempting to describe encompasses a deep feeling of reverence, respect, and awe for the Lord Jesus Christ, obedience to His commandments, and anticipation of the final judgment and justice at His hand. Thus, godly fear grows out of a correct understanding of the divine nature and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, a willingness to submit our will to His will, and a knowledge that every man and woman will be accountable for his or her own sins in the day of judgment. As the scriptures certify, godly fear is the beginning of knowledge, the instruction of wisdom, a strong confidence, and a fountain of life. Upon hearing the voice of God after partaking of the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve hid themselves in the Garden of Eden. God called unto Adam and asked, Where art thou? And Adam answered, I heard thy voice, and I was afraid. Notably, one of the first effects of the fall was for Adam and Eve to experience fear. This potent emotion is an important element of our mortal existence. An example from the Book of Mormon highlights the power of the knowledge of the Lord to dispel fear and provide peace even as we confront great adversity. In the land of Helam, Alma's people were frightened by an advancing Lamanite army. But Alma went forth and stood among them and exhorted them that they should not be frightened, but should remember the Lord their God, and He would deliver them. Therefore they hushed their fears. Notice Alma did not hush the people's fears. Rather, Alma counseled the believers to remember the Lord and the deliverance only He could bestow. And knowledge of the Savior's protecting watch care enabled the people to hush their own fears. Correct knowledge of and faith in the Lord empower us to hush our fears because Jesus Christ is the only source of enduring peace. He declared, Learn of me and listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit, and you shall have peace in me. The Master also explained, He who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. In the course of life, all of us spend time in dark and dreary places, wildernesses, circumstances of sorrow or fear or discouragement. Our present day is filled with global distress over financial crises, energy problems, terrorist attacks, and natural calamities. These translate into individual and family concerns, not only about homes in which to live, and food available to eat, but also about the ultimate safety and well-being of our children and the latter-day prophecies about our planet. More serious than these, and sometimes related to them, are matters of ethical, moral, and spiritual decay seen in populations large and small at home and abroad. But I testify that angels are still sent to help us, even as they were sent to help Adam and Eve, to help the prophets, and indeed to help the Savior of the world Himself. And so much ministrations will be to the righteous until the end of time. As Mormon said to his son Moroni, who would one day be an angel, has the day of miracles ceased, or have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? 
Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? Or will he, so long as time shall last or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. For behold, they are subject unto Christ to minister according to the word of his command, showing themselves unto them of strong faith and a firm mind in every form of godliness. I ask everyone within the sound of my voice to take heart, be filled with faith, and remember the Lord has said he would fight our battles, our children's battles and the battles of our children's children. And what do we do to merit such a defense? We're to search diligently, pray always, and be believing. Then all things shall work together for our good if we walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith we have covenanted. The latter days are not a time to fear and tremble. They are a time to be believing and remember our covenants. I desire now, if I may, for a few minutes to speak of a matter that is of common concern to each and every one of us. One of the greatest accomplishments of a person in this life is to develop and practice self-control. Self-control or mastery of one's temper is indicative of this self-mastery. Someone has said, the size of a man may be measured by the size of the things that make him angry. How true that is. To become upset or infuriated over trivial matters gives evidence of immaturity in a person. We are constantly exposed to irritations as we mingle with others and when we are alone. How we react to these irritations is a reflection of our personalities and our temperaments. It would seem reasonable to believe that in order to develop a healthy, pleasing personality and to become useful and an influence for good, one must avoid being easily provoked to anger. I have chosen tonight to speak to the subject of anger. I realize that this is a little unusual, but I think it is timely. A proverb in the Old Testament states, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. It is when we become angry that we get into trouble. The road rage that affects our highways is a hateful expression of anger. I dare say that most of the inmates of our prisons are there because they did something when they were angry. In their wrath they swore, they lost control of themselves, and terrible things followed, even murder. There were moments of offense, followed by years of regret. I thought of a verse from Ecclesiastes, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Anger is the mother of a whole brood of evil actions. Divorce too often is the bitter fruit of anger. A man and a woman fall in love, as they say. Each is wonderful in the sight of the other. They marry. All is bliss, that is, for a season. Then little inconsequential activities lead to criticism. 
Little flaws are magnified into great torrents of fault-finding. They fall apart, they separated, and then with rancor and bitterness they divorce. We are so easily offended. Happy is the man who can brush aside the offending remarks of another and go on his way. The story is told that reporters were interviewing a man on his birthday. He had reached an advanced age. They advised him, they asked him how he had done it. He replied, when my wife and I were married, we determined that if we ever got in a quarrel, one of us would leave the house. I attribute my longevity to the fact that I have breathed good, fresh air throughout my married life. <laughs> now, my dear brethren, in closing, I plead with you to control your tempers, to put a smile on your faces which will erase anger, speak out with words of love and peace, appreciation and respect. If you will do this, your lives will be without regret. Your marriages and family relationships will be preserved. You will be much happier. You will do greater good. You will feel a sense of peace that will be wonderful. May the Lord bless you and inspire you to walk without anger, without bitterness of any kind, but to reach out to others with expressions of friendship, appreciation, and love. The Lord has been very specific in his instructions to parents in this day. From the Doctrine and Covenants we read, And again, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion, or in any of her stakes which are organized, that teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, when eight years old, the sin be upon the heads of the parents. And they shall also teach their children to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord. And the inhabitants of Zion shall also observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now I, the Lord, am not well pleased with the inhabitants of Zion, for there are idlers among them and their children are also growing up in wickedness. They also seek not earnestly the riches of eternity, but their eyes are full of greediness. These things ought not to be and must be done away from among them. The language is direct, and it ne leaves no room for misunderstanding. The responsibility for training children rests primarily with the parents. So today I would like to echo again the counsel that has been heard almost from the beginning of time as a voice of warning to parents. If you abdicate your responsibilities of teaching and training your children and then expect some other institution to pick up this responsibility and immediately effect a transforma transformation, you expect what never was or never will be. Today there are many problems in our society, and so many of these problems are symptoms of failure in the home. President Benson has said, if we continue with present trends, we can expect to have more emotionally disturbed young people, more divorce, more depression, and more suicide. The family is the most effective place to instill lasting values 
in its members, where family life is strong and based on principles and practices of the gospel of Jesus Christ, these problems do not as readily appear. From the Council of Brigham Young, let us live so that the spirit of our religion will live within us. Then we will have peace, joy, happiness, and contentment, which will make such pleasant fathers, pleasant mothers, pleasant children, pleasant households, neighbors, communities, and cities. That is worth living for, and I do think that Latter-day Saints ought to strive for this. In Proverbs we read, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The virtuous woman described in Proverbs was a woman who was prepared. She worked willingly, stretched out her hand to the poor, saw to the physical needs of her household, sought after knowledge. She had profound reverence for the Lord. While many of her tasks may appear to be temporal in nature, her blessings were eternal ones. When we speak of preparedness, often our first thoughts center on temporal or physical preparedness—food, clothing, shelter. While these preparations are important and necessary, they are not all-inclusive. There is a crucial balance between the temporal and spiritual aspects of this principle. The Lord has said, All things unto me are spiritual, and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal. One sister told of her preparation to receive a general authority guest in her home for state conference. Everything was to be perfect. Extensive cleaning and cooking were done. Her ten children were prepped as to what should be their roles. She worked hard. By the time he arrived, she was exhausted and couldn't enjoy his visit. Too late, she realized that spiritual preparation was needful also. She stated, It is because of our spiritual preparation that we can find answers to our everyday challenges. It is because of our spiritual preparation that we can find joy in enduring and overcoming our trials. It is because of our spiritual preparation that we can feel the greatest joy of all, a nearness and closeness to our Savior and Father in Heaven." End quote. Often the advice that is given by our prophets is so simple and practical that we overlook it and fail to heed it. We are taught that we have great worth in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. The primary children sing, I am a child of God. The young women recite their theme, which begins, We are daughters of our Heavenly Father who loves us. And the prophets have declared that virtuous women are more priceless than rubies. Listen to this simple direction from our prophet to the young women of the Church, which applies to all of us. Live up to your divine potential. Remember who you are and the divine heritage that is yours. You are literally royal daughters of our Father in Heaven. Don't settle for less than what the Lord wants you to be." End quote. President Ezra Taft Benson has declared, When we put God first, all other things fall into their proper place or drop out of our lives. Our love of the Lord will govern the claims for our affections, the demands on our time, the interests we pursue, and the order of our priorities." End quote. We need to put God first and balance our spiritual and temporal preparations that we might become virtuous women, righteous daughters, instruments in His hands to help prepare the way for His coming.
When Jesus, of whom the choir has so beautifully sung, walked the dusty pathways of towns and villages, which we now reverently call the Holy Land, he said that every house divided against itself shall not stand, and later added, Behold, mine house is a house of order and not a house of confusion. Let our house be a house of order, said the Lord. For everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, said Ecclesiastes or the preacher, and so it is with you and with me. May we make time, time for our family, time for our work, time for recreation, time for service, time for study, time for meditation, but definitely time for Christ, and then our house will be a house of order. Well then, who am I? Those lacking in that important understanding and consequently in some degree fail to hold themselves in the high esteem which they would have if they did understand or lacking self-respect. May I begin to answer that question by posing two questions from scriptural texts which should be impressed upon every soul. The psalmist wrote, What is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. And the next is the question the Lord posed to Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Reduced to more simple language than the words of those questions from the scriptures, the prophets in these quotations are simply asking each of us, Where did you come from? Why are you here? The Apostle Paul wrote, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather live, be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? This suggests that all who live upon the earth, who have fathers on earth, likewise have a father of their spirits. So did Moses and Aaron, as they fell upon their faces, cry out, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all men, shall one man sin? Uh, wilt thou be worth wrath with all the congregation? Note how they addressed the Lord, the Father of the spirits of all mankind. You and I, having been spirits and now having bodies, were among those who passed that first test and were given the privilege of coming to earth as mortal individuals. So the Old Testament prophets declared with respect to death. And then shall the dust, meaning our mortal bodies, return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Obviously, we could not return to a place where we had never been. So we are talking about death as a process as miraculous as birth, by which we return to our Father who art in heaven, as the Master taught his disciples to pray. And who are you? You were all the sons and daughters of God. Your spirits were created and lived as organized intelligences before the world was. You have been blessed to have a physical body because of your obedience to certain commandments in that premortal state. You were now born into a family to which you have come into the nations through which you have come as a reward for the kind of lives you lived before you came here, and at a time in the world's history as the Apostle Paul taught the men of Athens, and as the Lord revealed to Moses, determined by the faithfulness of each of those who lived before this world was created. Wherefore men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men, or to choose captivity and the power according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. 
I trust that I might have given you and others who have not yet listened to such counsel that I may have stimulated some sober thinking as to who you are and from whence you came, and in so doing that I may have stirred up within your soul the determination to begin now to show an increased self-respect and reverence for the temple of God wherein dwells a heavenly spirit. I would charge you to say again and again, as the primary have taught those little children to sing, say it to yourself again and again, I am a son or a daughter of God, and by so doing begin to live closer to those ideals which will make your life happier and more fruitful because of an awakened realization of who you are. God grant that each of us here today may so live that all among us and with us may see not us, but that which is divine and comes from God. With that vision of what those who have lost their way may become and receive strength to climb higher and higher and upward and onward to that great goal of eternal life, the information in this presentation is taken from the Old Testament lesson material for various church classes and videos, all provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, unless otherwise noted.